Acts of revenge make for a great storyline, whether for a film or television show. However, revenge in the real world is typically a lot more gruesome. For Roy Allison Jr., it was just a fun night of partying with his two best friends. But for Roy Allison Sr., a father with a history of violent tendencies, it was an unforgivable act that deserved immense punishment. For Roy Jr.'s 28th birthday, Duncan Bell and Grant Maker came over to the home that Roy Jr. shared with his father. The three celebrated drinking, smoking, and later on, doing ecstasy. The next morning, Duncan came back to the house to find Roy Jr. dead, where he had passed out the night before. Roy Jr. and his father shared a tight bond after a divorce, so the pain Roy Sr. felt after losing his only son was gut-wrenching. Roy Sr. formed a seething rage and hatred for Duncan, whom he blamed for his son's death. A local newspaper and police station received a nine-page letter from Roy Sr. describing his heartbreak and rage, but by the time the police read the letter, it was far too late. Roy Sr. invited Duncan over to his home, knocked him unconscious, and stabbed him six times. Shortly after, Roy Sr. hanged himself in the crematorium where Roy Jr. was buried in hopes of being reunited with him. Duncan Bell's mother, Diane, has forgiven Roy Sr. for his violent act of revenge, stating he was a man that had lost his son. His world had disappeared. Akuyada was an infamous gangster in the slums of Kasturba Nagur, a neighborhood in South Delhi. He was known for many cruel deeds in his lifetime, but none surpassed the sexual assaults he committed on 200 women in his town. Aku had the police on his payroll, so when women came to them for aid, they were ignored or officers took turns abusing them as well. Usha Narayane and her family were attacked by Aku and his men one afternoon in 2004. Aku and 40 of his men surrounded her house, threatening to disfigure her face with acid, assault, and kill her. Usha, not backing down, insulted the man and threatened to blow everyone up if he didn't leave, and eventually, they left. While Aku was in court for other crimes, a mob of 200 women, led by Usha, broke down the barricade of the courtroom and rushed Aku. They threw chili powder in his face, stabbed him, and cut off his shortest extremity. Six women were accused of committing the murder of Aku, though all 200 claimed responsibility. They were all released due to lack of evidence, and the streets of Kasturba Nagur are a lot safer thanks to a revenge plot against a monster. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, which is why Jeanne de Clisson set out to let King Philip VI know exactly how she felt about her husband's untimely execution. Jeanne's husband, Olier de Clisson, fought as a soldier in the Hundred Year War. He was captured by the enemy and held for ransom until King Philip VI paid for his release. However, when he returned home, the king believed him to be an English spy, so he had him beheaded in 1343 for so-called treason. Jeanne vowed to avenge him. She sold her land, using the money to raise an army and buy a fleet of ships known as the Black Fleet after she dyed the sails blood red. For years, she exacted revenge against the French. Each time she attacked, she spared only one person so they could tell the king she was still not backing down. The French nicknamed her the Lioness of Brittany because of her relentless violence. Jeanne sailed up and down the English Channel for 13 years, even after the death of her sworn enemy. Eventually, she met and fell in love with an English noble named Sir Walter Brentley, a lieutenant for King Edward III. After that, Jeanne de Clisson, the Lioness of Brittany, left the pirate life for good. The Holocaust is one of the most tragic events in human history, and survivors have gone on to tell their stories about life under Nazi rule. 
However, there is one story that isn't often told. Nakam, Hebrew for vengeance, was the name of a group of Jewish Holocaust survivors that sought retribution for the crimes committed by the Nazis. Though Nazis were held in prisoner of war camps by the US military, some death camp survivors decided that wasn't enough. Ubba Kovner formed the first revenge group in 1945, and one night over some drinks, they devised different attack plans. Plans A and B failed as they couldn't poison the water supply, and the arsenic-laced bread only made the imprisoned Nazis sick. But this didn't slow them down or hold them back, so they moved on to Plan C. Posing as police and military officials, the revenge group entered Nazis' homes and told them they were needed for questioning. Once they had the Nazi in the car, they either shot or suffocated them. In some cases, the Nazis were tied up in the back seat of the car and dynamite was ignited in the trunk. Some of the men in Nakam have gone to trial over the punishments they were doling out, but no judge ever had the heart to convict the survivors. After all, some would say it was fair and just retribution for those who aided in mass genocide. The Han Dynasty was ruthless, powerful, and intimidating, but in 40 AD, the Emperor To Din was challenged by a couple of sisters who had had enough. Vietnam was under merciless Chinese rule for over 200 years, always in a constant state of struggle and hardship. The Vietnamese sisters Trung Ni and Trung Tak grew up in a military household where their father taught them tactics of war and martial arts. Tak, the eldest sister, married a man named T. Sok, who made a stand against the Chinese and was executed for it. Tak took up the mantle of her husband and went to war against the Han Dynasty, teaching her people martial arts and inspiring them to stand up for themselves. Tak and Ni reclaimed 65 cities from the Chinese, battling several times over the span of a few years. But they were no match for the Chinese and were eventually defeated. As the legend goes, the Trung sisters died in the most honorable Vietnamese way, by jumping to their deaths in a river. The Trung sisters' legacy is remembered in Vietnam through annual celebrations. Although the future traditions would restrict women in society, the Trung sisters have always been a banner of light that women can be just as mighty as a man. Buford Pusser was only 26 when he was elected Sheriff of McNary County in Tennessee. He was fully prepared to clean up crime lingering in his jurisdiction. But the criminals weren't about to let their territory go so easily. The Dixie Mafia and the State Line mob were bad news for McNary County, partaking in illegal moonshine business, gambling, robbing, and occasional prostitution. On February 1st, 1966, Pusser went down to the Shamrock Hotel, run by Louise Hathcock, to look into a robbery. Louise, having been involved with the robbery, pulled a gun on Pusser, hoping to get rid of him. However, the sheriff shot back in defense, killing Louise. Pusser shut down the moonshine business and sent Louise's boyfriend, Carl Towhead White, to jail. While incarcerated, Towhead ordered a revenge assassination on Pusser. Early one morning, Pusser took a call about a disturbance and his wife, Pauline, decided to join him. During the drive, a car followed close behind and ambushed them down the road. The assailants came for Pusser, shooting him in the face, so he later needed reconstructive surgery. But Pauline died in the passenger seat from her injuries. In August of 1974, Buford Pusser was in a fatal car accident which left him dead at the scene. To this day, his daughter, Dwana, maintains that it was murder. Pierre Picot, a humble shoemaker in South France, was engaged to be married to a beautiful and rich woman when his friends decided to intervene. Lupien, Solari, and Chaubert falsely accused Pierre of being an English spy, landing their dear friend in prison for seven years. While in prison, Pierre hoped that his lovely bride-to-be would be waiting for him upon his release, but he discovered that she was married to Lupien. Rage built inside of him and Pierre sought revenge on the three men. Chaubert was the first to go, killed by a hired hand. Compliments of Pierre. 
Next, he convinced Lupien's daughter to marry a criminal and eventually had the man arrested, causing her to die of a nervous breakdown. Pierre then had Lupien's restaurant burned down, his son framed for theft and sent to jail, and finally stabbed Lupien to finish it off. Pierre had Solari poisoned, though it's unclear who committed the act exactly. A fourth friend named Alou was aware of the false imprisonment, but chose to keep Pierre's innocence silent. Alou, ridden with guilt on his deathbed, learned that not saying anything at all was just as bad as participating. The voice of Adolf Hitler reached far beyond the borders of Germany. As his message spread, more countries adopted the Nazi way. But with liberation of one of Romania's death camps in 1944 came a desire for revenge. Eliahu Itzkowitz, the youngest of four boys, watched his parents and all three brothers murdered at the hands of a man named Stanescu. He survived the concentration camp and emigrated to Israel, where he joined the army as a paratrooper. Here he learned of Stanescu's whereabouts in a French Foreign Legion unit in Indochina. Eliahu deserted the Israeli army and enlisted in the French Foreign Legion, requesting placement in Stanescu's unit since they were old friends. There, the unit was ambushed by the Vietnamese, causing the group to split up. Eliahu and Stanescu hid together and Eliyahu's opportune moment finally came. He told Stanescu that he was one of the Jews from Romania and emptied the clip of his gun into his family's killer. After being discharged from the French Foreign Legion, Eliyahu was arrested for his desertion and served one year in prison, leading everyone to believe Stanescu was gunned down by enemy fire. The Isenai tribe residing in Britain in 47 CE was led by King Prasutagus. As the Romans conquered city after city, King Prasutagus kept peace with them and continued ruling his people with no Roman interjection. King Prasutagus hoped his daughters would keep the peace after he died, but after his passing, Rome advanced on the Isenai tribe, enslaving them and pillaging the kingdom. Both Roman officers and slaves took what they wanted from the tribe and had Prasutagus' wife, Boudica, stripped and flogged and his daughters sexually violated. Boudica stood her ground and became the tribe's leader, taking her people into war against Rome, toppling three cities and eliminating over 80,000 Roman citizens. However, the Romans eventually got the best of her, cornering the Iceni tribe in a field. Boudica and her daughters fought valiantly until they couldn't any longer. They escaped the battle and went into hiding, poisoning themselves to escape the Romans one final time. After conquering most of China, Genghis Khan reached out to befriend the Sultan of the Khwarezmian Empire in Persia. But instead of gaining a neighbor, Sultan Shah Allah ad-Din Muhammad gained an enemy instead. In the 13th century, the Mongols were not widely known outside of China, so when Genghis sent Muhammad a caravan of goods and over 400 well-wishers, Muhammad's uncle accused them of being spies. Muhammad had all the men killed, aside from one who sent word back to Genghis. Assuming the man had just made a simple mistake, the Khan sent three of his best ambassadors to clear things up, but again, his friendship was not accepted and one of the ambassadors was killed. At this point, Genghis Khan saw there would be no common ground with Muhammad, and he moved in to attack the Khwarezmian Empire. Muhammad escaped the Mongols, eventually trading his royal garb in for beggar's clothes to hide, and dying alone on an island far from home. But his uncle was captured, and had molten silver poured into his eyes and ears. That's all for now. If you'd like to help fight to keep creepy content on YouTube, I need your help. If you'd consider giving even $1 to my Patreon linked in the description below, that would be an immense help. If only 5% of my audience did this, we would guarantee that this kind of content would remain here. Again, check the link to my Patreon in the description below for more information and consider pledging even just $1. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out another one of my videos, and of course, press on screen now to subscribe to my channel, because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you 
next time.